Since its air show debut in 2005, the F-22 Raptor has amazed air show fans around the world. The nearly 15-minute demonstration showcases the Raptor's power and thrust vectoring capabilities that enable it to perform seemingly impossible maneuvers. Millions have seen the Raptor fly. Very few have witnessed the behind-the-scenes work necessary for the demo to take flight. In the spring and summer of 2010, video cameras captured nearly every aspect of a typical day for the F-22 demonstration team members. The following production provides amazing insight into what it takes to complete a successful F-22 demonstration. Over the next hour, you will meet the members of the 2010 demonstration team and learn about their specific roles and responsibilities. Stand on the tarmac with the ground crew as they launch the Raptor. Listen as team members describe the choreography of music and narration. Sit in the briefing room as the pilot explains how maneuvers are executed. Experience what it takes to become a member of the F-22 Raptor demonstration team. You're about to spend a day in the nest. The face of the F-22 Raptor demonstration team is the pilot. Major David Skalitsky, call sign Zeke, is the Raptor demonstration pilot for the 2009 and 2010 airshow season. Zeke is one of the more than a dozen individuals on the demonstration team. The 2010 team chief is Master Sergeant Greg Gappert. He is supported by the assistant team chief, Technical Sergeant Gabriel Sistrunk as well as designated crew chiefs and specialists who are responsible for keeping the jet airworthy and assisting at show sites. Team's superintendent, F-22 Raptor demo team superintendent, uh, uh, on an average, when it comes to uh, either a practice or a show itself, I come in about two to three hours before we brief. So if we brief at eight o'clock, I'm in at work about five to six in the morning. Have to go out and take a look at the aircraft, make sure the forms are uh, good to go, everything's signed off. Have to do a little bit of a aircraft review history. And that includes uh, flight controls, uh, engine, any uh, miscellaneous problems that the jet has had within the last 60 days. Uh, when you fly as low as Major Sklitsky does, can't have any type of uh, hiccups to basically the crowd safety, his safety, every, the aircraft safety is vital to this step. Once, uh, once a review is done, I go out and take a look at the jet, the jets are good. I go ahead and um, come back in, get the team set up, get the team ready to include uh, my crew chiefs and my specialists who will run the uh, music and the narration as well as my crew chiefs that do the launch. Uh, we'll brief up, depending on what time, we'll brief about an hour and a half prior to the show or practice. Uh, we do the show and the practice. I'm also the team's narrator, uh, one of them. So I'll, uh, either me or my assistant, Sergeant Sistrunk, will narrate for the show. Once the show is over, we we'll go back to the jet, make sure that the uh, jet landed, everything's good to go with the jet. One funny thing about the Raptor team, we don't have an aircraft that's specifically ours. So that's why I do the aircraft review and the history because it's every, every jet we get is a different jet. Uh, depending on where we are in the country or in this, in this case the world, uh, I have to call back to the base that the aircraft is assigned to and talk with their production, let them know how their jet is going. Basically just do a real quick one-on-one, -on -one. this is what flew, this is how long it flew, this is what it is, this is what it landed. Once we're done with that, then it's back to uh, either the, the, you know, we finish debriefing, make sure we all went good, and then uh, go from there. That's a typical day. Uh, it's usually about a 10 to 12 hour day for just a practice. Lots of behind the scenes type of stuff that most people don't uh, I didn't realize till I got on the team as, as far as, you know, I'm sure everybody else doesn't. I have a, about a 19, 17 to 19 man team. That includes uh, my assistant, Sergeant Sistrunk. It includes four crew chiefs, four specialists. Uh, we have also have two uh, Virginia National Guard members, as well as uh, when we're on the road, our safety observers. Uh, we have uh, six, six uh, captains now as our safety observers. My team members are not permanently assigned to me. They are assigned to the squadron. So I have to give them enough heads up, hey, I'm going to be taking these guys on the road with me. 
to ensure that their training is up to date and I'm not taking them in the middle of a, a po possible vital TDY or training mission for them. Um, this would be used about three to four months out. I need to start planning a show. That includes, you know, the hotel, the how we're getting there, the airline tickets. Ultimately, my responsibility is Major Sklitsky and the safety of him, as well as two F-22 Raptors worth $140 million each. That's basically, you know, that's, a, that's my job in a nutshell, to make sure that we perform, to uh, bring the fifth generation F-22 Raptor to the public and see, let them see what their uh, United States military has to offer. All right, well, my name is Technical Sergeant Gabe Sistrunk. I am the uh, Assistant uh, Team Chief uh, for the F-22 Demonstration Team here at Langley Air Force Base, Virginia. And uh, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about what my job is for the F-22 Demo Team. Uh, my job, essentially, is to make sure the team has whatever it needs uh, to put on a successful uh, aerial demonstration uh, wherever, we, wherever we're going to go in the country or the world. So, for example, if we're going to go to California and do an air show at, say, March Air Reserve Base in Riverside, California, my job is to make sure that the team can get there to get from Virginia to California. Once it gets there, it makes sure it has proper transportation, uh, make sure there's proper lodging, uh, make sure that uh, we have get been in contact with the public affairs folks out there, make sure we can do the outreach with uh, different schools and VA hospitals, uh, make sure that the, almost most importantly, that the, the pilot, Major Skalitsky, has what he needs to, to put on a, a successful show. Uh, so that may be coordinating with the fuel folks, uh, coordinating with the airfield folks to make sure the ramp is squared away. Uh, so uh, my particular job is multifaceted, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, if you want to go to, say, a public affairs aspect of kind of what I do, uh, all the folks on the team are trained uh, in media, and uh, so we try to do as much as we can to go and do radio shows to talk about the F-22 demo team and the United States Air Force and what we do in the Air Force. Uh, we, we talk about um, kind of how literally awesome this aircraft is, the F-22 Raptor, because it, it can do a lot of great things out there. And uh, th that's kind of what we do from a day-to-day -day basis when we're on, an, on a show. Now, let's say we're at home. Uh, we don't, obviously, you're not going to go out there and, and see the media as much, uh, but we do try to bring folks on to Langley Air Force Base. Uh, we try to show junior ROTC folks who may be in the local area, kind of show you what Langley is all about. And uh, it really is a lot of fun. As a specialist, my day-to-day uh, -day operation, I'm an avionics specialist. I, uh, my two systems that I specialize the most in would be flight controls and uh, environmental control system, you know, the, the, uh, the pilot's heat and air conditioning in the actual cockpit itself. Um, those are what I've been accustomed to working on the most, so I've become an actual specialist in those two areas, you know, the flight controls and the ECS. Those are my two favorite systems to work on a day-to-day -day basis. On the actual team, I fill a five-level specialist spot. We have a five-level and a seven-level on each show we go to. I'm a five-level, and what that means is uh, I'm in charge of filming every single show that we do, our practice and our two actual shows on, uh, during the actual show days in front of the crowd. We, uh, we film every show because it's a safety issue. We, uh, we want to make sure that if something were to go wrong, we have visual evidence of what happened and why it happened and where it happened. And we do use in our debriefs. We all get together as a team each night and watch the entire demo. And uh, the major goes over everything that went right. And if anything did go wrong, he talks about that as well. And we have it so we can hear the narration and the music go on during the demonstration. We can talk about that as well. Uh, for the min radius turn Prior to each demonstration, the team gathers for a pre-flight briefing where the pilot reviews the logistics of the upcoming demo. This includes identifying which jet will be flown, the layout of the show line, weather conditions, a walkthrough of the demo, team assignments, and identification of potential hazards. After the briefing, team members disperse to execute their duties. Those responsible for narration, music, and video, as well as the safety observer, head to the show center while a pilot and crew chiefs prepare the jet for launch. Other members will work at the team's tent, selling souvenirs and answering questions from airshow fans. Narration is an important part of the demo, and can be much harder than it looks. Master Sergeant Gappert explains the challenges of narrating the F-22 demonstration. As one of the team's narrator, uh, part of my job is to uh, get the get the crowd enthused. It's Raptor time. Who's ready? Yeah. Minnesota, I can't hear you. Who's ready? Yeah. When I do the narration, and it's all based on Major's flying. Major Sklitsky flies, so I have to judge how I how I talk, how fast I am, how slow I am, and how I emphasize stuff to his performance. So literally, you have to memorize 
every position that he's at. Wherever he is, is in the sky, you need to be able to look at and find within a, within a few seconds. Every air show is a little different. Uh, that is why it's so hard to get this down. Uh, you have to, Major Skalitsky cannot hear me as he's doing his reposition, so I have to time what I say to when I think the, fan, the public can hear me. If I have a crowd line of, up, of a, a mile long, if you start too early, the crowd to the left can't hear. If you start too late, the crowd to the right can't hear. So you have to base your judgment on that. That's why we review the tapes on Friday, and I pick a spot every time I do the narration. I pick a spot to start the, the narration, and then once I review the tape, I'll listen to see, okay, I could hear it, I couldn't hear it. So I need to start either two seconds early or two seconds later. I can honestly say it took me about a year of constant reading in front of the TV, constant, uh, my, I think my neighbor thought I was a little loony out there mowing my grass and, and riding my motorcycle to work as I was literally going through the narration. Uh, Major Skalitsky uh, told us when we first started, and I t at a time I think I was like, well, you know, it's just narration, it's just talk. It's not. It's all, this whole thing is all about what the presents. You know, how we say it, how we present it, if we are very monotone, very blah, the crowd will see that. Yeah, the jet will take over, and it's all about the jet, but it's, you can add so much to it by articulating what you need to emphasize. The beginning of the narration is pretty, pretty standard. He's, we have certain blocks in there right before uh, we tell him to run it up, and then there's also a break release. So I'll come to a word and say, run it up. And this is the, the safety observer tells him that, run it up, and then break to release. And then I will listen to the, the, either the sound of the jet coming, or I, if I can see him, I'll watch it. And I'll slow my narration or speed my narration, or maybe take out a word here or there to, you know, your F-22 Raptor, just as it hits. I time what I say. And I have my music guy watch me because once he goes into the mid radius, it's a very loud, a full afterburner turn. He'll go up. As soon as I see that nose go up into the air, I turn the microphone on. I look at my music guy. He gets ready. As soon as Major Skolski pushes the nose over, ladies and gentlemen, you know, let me get your attention to the amazing J turn. And you want to time that just as his nose goes up and kind of stops as he loses airspeed and starts rotating the weapons bay pass. That one is actually a very difficult one to get uh, to get through. I had a lot of problems when I first started it. It's a very in-depth, very uh, big words is the best way to say it. It's got a lot of, lot of uh, pronunciation and articulation. If Major comes in a little faster, a little slower, you'll hear either me or uh, Sergeant Sistrong will speed up or slow down the narration. And it's, you know, you'll speed it up because you want to time it. The timing is all about timing, everything we do. It, just as he turns his belly, it, you kind of want to say, all right, you know, if you have ever wonder where the bombs and missiles hide, here is your answer. And you can say, here is your answer, here is your answer. It's all on how you present it. You just got to emphasize it when you do that. Once he gives you the weapons bay pass and pulls off, now he's going out for the dedication pass. So you need to start, as soon as he kind of sign it, it gets kind of quiet, you can start the, the narration. It's not a very long narration. So you kind of get the narration out just as he's about at my, I started when he's about my one o'clock, I'll start it. And then you can let the music go. And it's all about what that, what that maneuver represents. It's not about what I say, it's not, it's not about it's not about that or it's about the jet, it's about what that represents. Pedal turn. That one's a very cool one. Uh, I like the song that goes to that pedal turn, uh, depending on which one. That one's a tough one, but Major Sklitsky doesn't really like doing the 180-180. Uh, we kind of, as a team, generally consider the 360 degree flat spin that he does a little bit more, I think it's a little bit more on-pressing than the 180 stop 180 because we have to go a lot higher for the 180-180. That's a short narration, not too much to it. Uh, you know, Major Skutsky will pull into the vertical and executes a full 360 degree aileron roll at altitude. The jet will then flip backwards and level off. And you want to flip backwards. You got to very cut, very sharp, very articulate what you have to say. Now, when I when I'm watching him, when I'm doing that, and you know, and, and my music guy times it to that. As soon as Major Skutsky does his 360, and you'll go up, and you'll watch, and as soon as he flips, and the belly is to the to the crowd. As soon as he flips over. Now, 
that, and then you can get that out because the music's kind of quiet. You know, now in less than 2,000 feet of altitude and under complete control. Major Sklitsky will execute a full 360 degree flat turn. You can say that because there's no jet noise or no nothing and everybody can kind of see what he's doing. I think it puts more on it as I'm talking and they're actually watching it. About the power loop and honestly, that is probably my favorite maneuver as well as Major Sklitsky's wife actually. Um, He'll come out of that, he'll come out, bang off to the right, and that one is, again, timed. The music has to be timed to me, I have to be timed to Major Sklitsky. The tough part is Major Sklitsky cannot hear any of us. So he'll go off and you want to, you know, this this maneuver is all about the vector thrust of the two powerful F-119 engines which literally flip the aircraft through the vertical and back to level flight. Again, very sharp, very has to be articulated. And then you want to get, the music is timed, it's a power, uh, it's a uh, saliva. Uh, song and you want to you want to get the ump to that song about when Major Skalitsky you can kind of picture him in the cockpit just pulling for all he's worth on that on that jet and basically the backflip and that's the backflip in the air once he gets to the backflip you kind of look at the music guy and you wait and you wait and as soon as he comes out of it and he starts you see kind of the tail kind of shifting over to the left or the right depending on which side Major Skalitsky is going to do the loaded roll take the music down stay with him ladies and gentlemen the loaded roll Start about 9, 10 o'clock position, you start reading the narration. You can start the music early because it's kind of a quiet song, but it's a long song and you need to time it exactly to when Major stops. And this is when he'll come fly over from behind you, come over, go into the vertical, and you need to time it exactly or pretty quick to the stop and stare. Because you can, you literally, it's the neatest thing when you're on stage and you look down and you're looking at thousands of people and everybody's just got that look on their face, they're stopping and staring exactly when it's told to. I swear that's one of the neatest maneuvers. This one, we don't have to worry about the music as well. Uh, it, I can go, we can kind of dim down the music. This is your slow speed pass. I'll start reading the, the uh, slow speed pass and that one, again, has to, it, it's an impressive maneuver, but I think some of the some of the narration makes it more impressive. They don't really know how slow he is until I tell them this is how slow he's going. And the only way you can do it, you know, it's virtually impossible. You know, there's, there's, you just need to emphasize certain words that make it go, oh, okay, no other plane can do that because now if they had another plane in the air doing it with him, then you can literally see how slow he is going for a jet that big. Start the slow speed pass narration, not, not too difficult. You know, so as soon as I finish the narration, music guy starts the Led Zeppelin song. And honestly, from all the ACC teams, they all want us to lose the, the when the levee breaks, because they all want it. So, but that's that's a Raptor song, I think. Uh, so he'll do the slow speed pass. He'll go out of it. Uh, literally, one of the funny thing is, as far as the demo team, as far as us, we know how slow Major Sklitsky is going is when we get into the lyrics. We've heard the song a thousand times. And it's always so, as soon as I all of a sudden hear lyrics, I'm like, oh, wow, he is really creeping now. Because it's a very long song, and that's just all based on how slow he is going. Next, next maneuver is the uh, high-speed pass. High-speed pass, again, the music can start immediately as soon as I start reading. Um, because it's more about the song. It's not really about what I have to say, and, and, but it is to a point where, you, again, you're telling him how fast he's going you know, from 60 to 600 knots. You know, virtually untouchable. You need to emphasize this because, yeah, a lot of jets can go that fast, but a lot of jets aren't stealth and can go that fast. So again, get the get the narration out, but you need to get it out before he comes screaming by and nobody can hear you. And again, you have to consider your your crowd line. You got half a mile to a mile of crowd line. People at the very far left. You need to get everything out before Major Sklitsky comes screaming by them. So again, get the narration out and let the music and the jet take over what it has to do. The Hoover pitch is, a, is a basically a dedication to a legendary aviator, Bob Hoover. Uh, this one, not, not, uh, not too difficult to get down. It is, once again, going out to the right, coming in, let the song take over. Just, you know, kind of a solemn, doesn't need to be, hey, hoorah, doesn't need to be oomphed like that. Let, that. let the music and the jet take that one. That's what gives a, the, the uh, people a really good good uh, side view of the aircraft. Once we do the uh, Hoover pitch, that's uh, depending on if we have a heritage flight or if he's landing. Major Sklitsky just loves to do this to me, He'll uh, or, or me or Gabe. He'll uh, come in maybe a little hot in the next maneuver, and that's a tack pitch. Uh, that one is a very neat maneuver. It's uh, not really a maneuver, it's just a reposition. 
So when Major comes in, he's coming in nice and slow, nothing too cosmic, but there is a lot to say. You know, since April 1950, you're in the United States Air Force, and it's a whole page of narration. Once you start part of it, you really have to get through it or cut it off, and sometimes it sounds kind of goofy. Well, again, Major Skalitsky cannot hear us do the narration. He can't hear, and it's not about the music. It's about what we're telling you. This, is, this aircraft is what is protecting the skies above, and you need to let everybody know. And uh, he has a tendency to come in a little hot and fast on us. This is key to having the narration memorized, is you can literally stop it and pick, because when you're saying it, you're thinking about four or five sentences ahead. You have to. There's no other way. So when you're saying it and you're talking and you're watching him, and now you're like, nope, I'm not going to get this all out. So now i got to think of a sentence that I can stop and get what I need to say. And it's, you know, there is no battlefield. He cannot dominate. You need to get that dominate out just as the augmenters are pulling it to the crowd, and it's all afterburn. And that is just, that is another maneuver that just wows everybody. Everybody loves that one. And then you finish up with uh, reading, you know, and this concludes today's demonstration. One operational aspect the public does get to see is the launch. The launch is typically accomplished by two crew chiefs and the pilot. The AMAM is the crew chief stationed in front of the jet and has overall responsibility for going through the launch with the pilot. During the launch, the AMAM observes flight control movements, engine run-ups, and any other checks the pilot wants to go through. The B-Man assists the launch by removing safety pins, verifying checks, and pulling the chocks. The launch is complete when the aircraft is marshaled out of its spot and begins rolling toward the runway. Once the jet reaches the end of the runway, the demonstration begins. And I'm honored to be your narrator for today. Uh, the be beginning of the narration is pretty cut and dry. It's, it's uh, explaining the team the, and uh, basically the aircraft, what the aircraft brings to the, the fight. Well, we can't show you everything that makes the Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor truly a next generation fighter. You will be witness to its raw power and thrust vectoring capabilities as it executes maneuvers that no other combat ready fighter aircraft in the world can perform. Our demonstration today is flown by a mission ready pilot in an unmodified, fully combat capable F-22 Go We're doing a narration over background music, and then once he's going to take off, we hit a, a cue in the, the narration, right where he starts to say maximum, maximum power, we uh, switch to the next song. Thousand rounds of 20 millimeter ammunition per minute. It is a true first look, first shot, first skill weapon system. Minus live missiles, bombs, and bullets, the aircraft and pilot you will see today are 100% ready to go to war. First, from your right, you'll see the Raptor execute a maximum power takeoff, producing 70,000 pounds of thrust from its two powerful F-119 engines. The Raptor will virtually leap off the runway in an amazing 1,000 feet. At a safe altitude, Manus Kalinsky will then quickly loop the aircraft and then roll while diving straight down. So now, it's time to stand up, move forward, and get ready. The show is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the most fear combat aircraft in the world today, your F-22 Raptor. But I was basically at show center, I was right at about 250 knots. So it was right on the parameter that we're shooting for. The target airspeed is 250 knots. Uh, we're right at it as I'm hitting show center. Um, 
but I didn't want to get into a real aggressive pull. Uh, the only time you ever see me do the real aggressive pull is if I'm closer to 300. Uh, the maximum airspeed for the, there really is no maximum airspeed for the pull, but the minimum or the target airspeed is 250, and that's right where I'm at. So I just do a nice smooth pull, but there was actually some vapor uh, coming off the jet right as I went into the vertical there. So I saw that, I'm like, ooh, there might be a little bit of vapor uh, in the air today. So that was good. So just make the nice smooth pull to about 75 degrees nose high and then inch the nose up to, uh, to 90 degrees nose high, making sure that it's climbing, uh, climbing real well, uh, which it was. And as soon as you cleared the tree line here, uh, as soon as you cleared that tree line, there was a little bit of wind coming from the right. And so the nose actually hunted over from this perspective, kind of hunted over to the right just a little bit. Uh, and I used a little bit of left pedal to kind of get it back uh, straight. But as it went over the top, because it had that wind, it kind of came out. Uh, if you think about it, uh, this direction, as it flopped, it came out kind of pointed at you guys just a little bit. I'm um, talking five degrees, uh, maybe five to 10 degrees, maybe. Probably not noticeable on the ground. Did you guys see anything on the ground? For me, it's noticeable and here's why. Because as it goes over the top and it's in a high alpha um, type of a condition, uh, if I'm not centered up physically in space, my flight path is now going straight down, but my nose is about 10 degrees off. Um, so as it rolls, it's going to have more of a more of a barrel roll looking effect than just a pure about the nose of the act, uh, of the jet roll. Um, so we'll watch it here um, and just see if you can see. So the nose is hunting over to the right just a little bit. So it's falling. So now as it comes over, I'm pointing back at you. I mean, that's all well within the parameters and everything. I'm still above the, the minimum altitudes uh, that I need for this. I need to be out of this and recovered by 2,500 feet, and I was well above that. Was it really that loud? After our first song on a roll for reposition to the minimum radius, is uh, that's where our cue is there. Radius turn, uh, really nothing for the min radius turn. It comes around uh, just fine. I'm right at about 280 knots, uh, which I'm trying. I'm shooting for between three, 250 and 300 knots is what I'm shooting for uh, as, I, as I exit the, uh, the turn. So I'm right in there at 280 knots. Uh, I roll wings level just for a second and then pop it into the vertical. Uh, a little bit of vapor comes off the jet, which was good, uh, and then push it back over right at about 2,500 feet, which is, is what I need for the, uh, uh, for the J turn. As I pushed, uh, it got a little bit slow. I was down at about 120 knots. Normally, I would try and be at about 150, so I'm a little bit slow as I do this uh, push over the top. So now as I enter into the, uh, the J-turn, I'll pop the nose up. Uh, it'll go about 70 degrees nose high, but now since I don't have quite as much energy on the jet, it takes a little bit longer for the actual J-turn to develop. And as it does it, uh, what's gonna happen is the nose is gonna slice over to the side a little bit, uh, but then it's gonna actually dip the wings up and kind of flatten it out and it's gonna look, the backside of it's gonna look almost pedal turnish rather than J-turnish, uh, which is what we're shooting for. As I came out, I bled a little bit more than I wanted to. Uh, as I was going uphill, so I'm a little bit slower here at the top. I extend just for a potato or two to get a, a, a little bit of extra speed on there, um, but still as I go into this, it's a little bit slow, so flatten the thing out, and it's gonna kind of rock around like that, rather than just do a nice pure hammerhead kind of a maneuver. Um, again, the min altitudes on that, I'm still well above my min altitudes and my min air speeds, uh, so I'm within the parameters, uh, but just visually, that's what you're gonna see on it. After he dumps it on a J-turn, he's come around here for the weapons bay door pass about the 12 o'clock position. For us, right as he's rotating back around this way, we'll hit play on the next song for open weapons bay. And he usually lines up about right. It's so right when he's opening the doors, we get into the, the part of music we want you to hear the most. And so as I roll out, um, it throws those huge stabs, which have the same surface area as the wing of an F-16. It deflects those things to get the roll going, uh, but now to stop that roll, it has to throw them again completely in the opposite direction. And I overshoot just a bit, not much, but just a bit. Uh, so you see it kind of do this little kind of extra bobble, and that's me just trying to nail it. Uh, but I, I didn't, I missed a little bit today. I was about five degrees or 10 degrees uh, overbanked. So if you watch on the rollout. Right here, just a little bit over, and then it corrects itself back uh, there to neutral. Five, 
Bays open up. Good to see uh, we had two AM9s hanging there today, so that was uh, kind of neat. Uh, again, we can fly this in, in any configuration, so it doesn't matter if there's AMRAMs loaded, bombs loaded, whatever, and AM9s loaded. It, it's, it's all going to look the same, so uh, today we had two AM9s. After that, he comes in for a dedication. We like to hit the dedication right when he's uh, coming in, leveling off, and he turns for the arc. We like to hit the music we want you to hear the most right on that position. Talk about the uh, the actual pull on the dedication. Uh, right here, I'll start it from uh, about 4,000 4, feet, um, 3,500 feet to 4,000 feet is where I'll start. Uh, I'll do the tuck under roll on the Whipperdale reposition. And I'll start carving back in. Uh, I'm at about 300 knots as I'm as I'm carving back in here, uh, and then I'll let the jet settle down as I enter the uh, the aerobatic container. Uh, I'll let it settle down to about 300 feet. I was a little high on this one. I was about 300 and, uh, 380 feet, um, but. I was okay with that. I don't mind being a little bit higher than normal because uh, the jet is accelerating so fast. It goes from about 300 knots uh, to 0.9 Mach, which is right around uh, about 580 knots is what I was hitting at the corner here. Uh, and on that pull, it accelerated from 0.9 Mach right at the corner uh, all the way to 0.94 Mach, which is the absolute limit. Uh, and so I allowed it to creep up there. I'm on a hard stop pull almost the entire time, pulling between eight and a half and nine Gs the entire way around uh, that corner. But uh, it's still the jet still accelerates. So by the time, even though I hit the corner at about 400 and uh, or sorry 580 knots, 590 knots, I'm accelerating past 600 knots on the backside of this on a, a nine and a half nine nine G pull essentially the entire way around. Uh, the cool thing is that that uh, airspeed, kind of a transonic region with that much G on the jet, you get some some good vapor. So uh, today we actually uh, were able to get a little bit of vapor off the jet. So there you go. There's the big, uh, the big vapor puff that uh, um, people see in the uh, uh, a lot of the, the magazines and stuff. Um, and of course, you know, I'd love to take credit for for that vapor, but you know, look at what we had. We had you know humid conditions that that just went away, and that's what generates vapor. You know, I mean, a lot of it is due to the aerodynamics of the uh, the aircraft, uh, but a lot of it is due to the atmospherics uh, that we have on any any, any given day. So. Uh, um, you know, sometimes you get you get lucky with the uh, the vapor, uh, but it really it's just a function of, uh, of of the conditions you're given. So it was neat to see, though. Uh, I like it when it's uh, when it's humid like that, and we actually get the chance to see good vapor like that because it, it really tells you a little bit more about what's going on with the aircraft and aerodynamically. Uh, so that was neat to see. Hop out of that, we get an ops check uh, just to see how much gas is, uh, is in the bag still. Uh, and I was at about 11,000 pounds, so I'd burned through about 4,000, 4,500 pounds of gas so far. But uh, the good thing is, less than 11,000 pounds. That means I've burned most of the uh, uh, gas out of the wing tank. So now we're ready to do some more high, some actual high alpha uh, maneuvering. You don't need to do that, have the gas out of the bags to do the high alpha maneuvering. But um, just from a um, with the gas out of there, you know it's going to be symmetric every time. You know you don't have an imbalance of any kind. Uh, it's a good chance to just come down and cross check and make sure all the fuel systems are feeding correctly. Uh, and that everything is, is going to be centered up as we start getting into some more of the maneuvering. We'll start the next set of songs or the next song right after the narration ends. So as soon as, as, soon as you hear the narration stop, we hit play, then you'll hear the, the rock fist. All right, so now as I come back in, I'm at 300 feet. Uh, right at about 300 knots, I light the afterburners just prior to show center, uh, and then go ahead and uh, pull into the vertical as soon as I see those things lighting. Uh, I get established in the vertical, uh, do a nice 360 degree roll, flop, and a nice 360 degree pedal, which uh, goes right around. <laughs> Um, 
that's a maneuver that everyone thinks is, you know, wow, how did it do that, uh, that full 360 degree flat spin? Uh, and that's exactly what it is, but it's all wired into the flight control logic of the computer. So um, what it does is as it flops over the top, so after I do that roll, uh, the jet flips, uh, and now all I'm doing is I'm just main, um, I've got the, the stick full aft, uh, so it's basically just going to sit there and fall. And if I did nothing else, the jet would sit there and fall uh, just like this at about 70 to 80 degrees angle of attack and just fall straight out of the sky. Um, but I feed in a pedal input, uh, so I just put the pedal all the way down to the floor uh, to induce some yaw. And what that does is, unlike in a normal plane, if you put in the pedal input, it'll move the rudders over, and that's how you get any kind of yaw there. Well, the jet's only going 100 uh, knots or so, and the relative wind is hitting it at about 70 to 80 degrees angle of attack, almost uh, straight out the bottom of the jet. So what it does is, the rudders aren't going to do any good at that point, so because the airstream is hitting the bottom of the jet. So what the jet does is it uses the stack to actually deflect all right so it tips the uh, it'll actually usually it's the outboard one first that it'll start moving uh, and then it'll dip the inner one and then it'll actually kind of chatter them a little bit uh, and get the jet moving around and you can see it on the tape as you watch uh, you'll see the uh, the stab will move, it'll dig in a little bit, and it'll start getting the jet yawing around uh, as it approaches kind of the limit uh, of what it, what it wants to do without putting the jet out of control uh, into a no kidding flat spin, which would be really impressive. Uh, it gets to kind of its control limit, and then it says that's enough, and it'll kind of streamline them back out. Uh, as the jet's yaw rate kind of slows down a little bit or isn't as much as I'm asking, uh, it puts it back in. And that's all 100% controlled by the, the flight control's uh, logic and the computers. Uh, I I'm not making any changes to my inputs on the in the cockpit. I'm 100% I'm holding straight back on the stick with my foot flat on the floor, and I'm not touching a thing. So all the movement that you see out of these stabs, deflecting and not deflecting, deflecting and not deflecting, is the uh, the jet just riding up against uh, kind of those those limits that it has to just go ahead and roll itself around. So, or yaw itself around. Excuse me. 360 degree roll and then a pull as the jet gets to the high angle of attack here. And now right here. I'll start feeding in the pedal input, and so notice how the stabs are split right there, um, and it had, again, the outside stab, it actually deflects that one uh, first, <clears throat> and it kind of drags the inside stab, and what that does is, um, think of it like a, uh, Think of it like a snowboarder or a, or a, a surfer who's dragging his inside uh, hand on the uh, either the curl of the, the wave or uh, on the uh, on the snow, uh, and that's all it's doing is it's just dragging that to go ahead and start carving around and pivot about that spot. And so this one is actually relatively smooth, but you see a little bit of chatter on the stabs there. And again, that's the computers. That's not me. That's making those things wiggle back and forth like that. That's just the computer saying, hey, the pilot is asking for X amount of yaw rate right now, uh, so I'm going to give him that, and it just kind of make sure that it continues to uh, uh, give me exactly what I'm asking for. Out of that uh, exchange, I come out of the, uh, the pedal, I let it stop on about a 45 degree reposition line. I'm at 2,600 feet above my min altitude, which is 2,500 feet to go ahead and come out of the, uh, uh, that maneuver and break the, uh, break the angle of attack and start getting the jet moving forward again. Uh, and all I basically do is neutralize the controls. Um, and that's another thing is in a, uh, a normal flying aircraft or normal um, classically controlled aircraft, in order to stop that condition, I would have to counteract or you know, go the opposite direction with the controls from where I was doing. Uh, not the case in the Raptor. All I simply do is neutralize all the controls. Neutralizing all the controls, computer says, okay, the pilot doesn't want to do this yawing move anymore. It, he wants to stop, and so it just literally stops and starts flying forward again. And that's all that's going on there. So it's not me um, aggressively doing anything with the controls to stop it or counteract it. I simply stop asking for what I was asking before and it says, okay, you wanna fly straight and level again, here you go. Uh, so off it goes. You'll see him come around here. We let that play for a little while longer. He's coming in for the power loop. Once he's lined up on a runway for the power loop, he levels off pretty much. That's when we hit it. So as soon as you hear, you'll hear the music and the song we're using this year Right when he's hitting this part, it's like a pause. So you, it really accentuates the rotation of the aircraft. About 250 knots right at 1500 feet as I'm getting set to go into this, uh, uh, this maneuver. I light the afterburner just prior to show center, confirm that I got good lights, uh, that the engines are spooling up correctly. Uh, and then as I'm going through, uh, right as I start to begin the pull there, verifying all that stuff on the displays that uh, uh, the motors are lighting, I'll just go straight back with the stick all the way to the hard stop and tell it, just go ahead and go high angle of attack and, and pull over the top. So it should go like that. Um, something interesting that happened today, um, as the jet went up, it went up just fine, but now as it came over the top and it slowed down, it hung up on its back a little bit longer than normal. Uh, 
And as it did that, it's starting to get the uh, kind of the whip effect where it's really going to rotate around that one spot in the sky. But what happened is as the jet started falling again and the wind was kind of pushing it uh, off to, towards the crowd, um, it starts falling and kind of pushing in towards the crowd. So from this angle, right as it's on its back, um, it starts kind of getting pushed that way. So now the jet starts to fall this way, but the nose whips around over here. So now aerodynamically, the wind is coming a little bit from the left side of the airplane. Uh, so what that sets up is as it comes around, the jet is actually falling, if you will, straight down, um, but a little bit actually kind of this way. So it's skidding kind of into the crowd in a high angle of attack. It's not a big deal. It's still well within the limits and well above the safety parameters in, in altitude and airspeed uh, for this maneuver. Um, but what it's going to mean is that now as I neutralize those controls, uh, just like I did coming out of the other maneuver, it's saying, hey, he's not asking for the nose to be right of where the wind is going. He's asking for it to be centered up. So what's going to happen is as it comes out of this, it's going to actually yaw just a little bit. Again, we're talking 5, 10 degrees, uh, but you're going to see it. It's going to yaw just a little bit back in towards the crowd, and the nose is going to end up pointing a little bit closer to the crowd. So right here, the jet goes up. Everything's looking good. It's down the card, nice and centered up. And notice how it really hangs up here a little bit longer than normal before it whips around. And now right here is the jet. You notice that just that little bit of a yaw right there as it comes out of that thing. And nothing, uh, nothing really of note on the loaded roll. The jet just uh, loaded up to about 30, uh, uh, 36 degrees angle of attack. And just let the thing roll around and come right back out of it. Uh, I actually gained about 500 feet during the maneuver, which is normally what I do, four to 500 feet. We come out, it has a loaded roll, and then a tail slide. We use a position this time instead of a roll, a position on a reposition here at about 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, somewhere in that area, to line it up for a perfect tail slide. He'll come and stop and stare is the song we use. So right as he's at the top, it starts to slide backwards, you hit the stop and stare. And usually right there is about the time that will line that up perfect. He'll come up, it's supposed to be stop and stare. Right when he stops, and the side starts sliding down. You know, that, that song is almost like they wrote it for that aircraft. The stuff that it can do. concerned of if I see one of the stabs as we go up as, as the jet is sitting up there uh, what is apparent is any kind of yawing motion if one of the stabs starting deflecting early those are all indications that um, the jet's starting to maybe pitch over a little bit or yaw over uh, a little bit which is really all I'm concerned about on the slide the jet's gonna fall I mean you know I, I pull the power back uh, and never use any afterburner so the jet is gonna fall out of the sky it's just a matter of keeping keeping it within the kind of the limits of uh, side slip this one was nice and stable. I never got more than about one to two degrees of side slip at any point in there. Uh, so it stops right about there. And now as she backs up, um, initially it's nice and smooth. The stabs start deflecting up there. Again, um, they're chattering uh, a little bit. You see them start to deflect and you know kind of do this, this act where they're just kind of flopping. Um, I'm not changing much in, in the cockpit at all. All I'm doing is smoothly and slowly just bringing the stick back. And already by now, by this point, I'm already on the, uh, the hard stop, just holding the nose where it's at. What's going on is as the jet starts sliding backwards, um, the flight control computer is telling, is is basically trying to put the nose back down because it says, hey, you're going backwards here. You, you probably don't want to be flying the jet backwards. You probably want to be flying this way if that's the way we're actually going to move. Uh, but what I'm doing is actively telling it, no, I do want my nose up there. So I'll do that um, and pull all the way to the hard stop and say, nope, I want to keep my nose right here. Um, and it'll, it'll allow me to do that. Uh, and then approaching about 75 knots backwards or so, you know, okay, pay, pay Newton his due. He, he made things fall, you know, for a reason, right? Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll pitch the nose back over and uh, so we don't get going too fast in reverse. At 75 knots backwards. Really all I do is just back off the controls and, and let, let it, the, uh, the flight control computer put the nose where it wants to, which is going downhill. For the slow speed pass, 
once he pitches up and the narration is done, we hit play and you got the Led Zeppelin. I came in at about 600, 600 feet or so, 650 feet, uh, and then loaded up the high angle of attack and kind of let it climb just a little bit until I got to my parameters and then just held the, uh, the pass by between 80 and 85 knots was what I was holding uh, the entire time and just modulating the power uh, and actually um, something that's unique about this, uh, this pass is uh, you're on the, the back side of the power curve because we're not using any afterburner uh, so I'm just using kind of mill power um, is I'm, I'm actually controlling my altitude with the power that's going to control how high I am as the jet just continues to move forward and I'm controlling the speed that I'm at with my, with my right hand with the uh, this control stick because if I push forward just a little bit the nose will drop down and the jet will accelerate a little bit. The, f the problem with it letting it accelerate too much is that if it accelerates at all it's going to want to start climbing again so now you start pulling the power again and you kind of end up in this you know left hand right hand you know patch your you know tummy rub your noggin whatever. What I've been working on and trying to do um, as opposed to last year where we would fly way to the edge of the crowd line and then go all the way down is I've been trying to keep it a little bit closer to the crowd and just let them see, load up, load up the high angle of attack a little closer and just go past the crowd and then go so it doesn't take quite as long. So don't know if we'll ever get back into the lyrics. Roll over and split S, come down, and right as he's hitting a high speed and he's leveled out, you hear the up-tempo music. And then right at, uh, right at 4,000 feet, roll it on its back, come back in a pure split S, and then start going the opposite direction for the high speed pass. Okay, acceleration on this, uh, on this pass is, is awesome. It's not quite as good as it was when we were doing the Comac certs where we had the, uh, the real, real cold weather. Um, but uh, I bottom out of that thing and I'm going about 350 to 400 knots as I, come, as I come out of the vertical. And I'm intentionally not allowing the jet to accelerate too much in the vertical because the last thing I want to do is come out of this split S maneuver where I'm pointed at the ground uh, and be accelerating down towards the ground too much and now I have to try and square the corner down here. It's something I don't want to do. So I allow the jet to come out of this at about 350 to 400 knots in a nice smooth um, kind of curve and then now I'm gonna just let the thing accelerate uh, which is mind-numbing the kind of acceleration that you get at the, in this jet down low. Uh, like I said, I was at about 350 knots at the uh, edge of the runway. By the time I'm at show center, I'm pushing 600 knots right up against the mock. And again, a little bit of vapor in the uh, in the air today. So as you see, those kind of uh, um, shot cones starting to build. Again, only 0.94 Mach. That's all the most we can get to. But then, as soon as I start uh, to pull back, you actually see the airflow separation kind of approaching that transonic um, airflow, which makes a nice big cloud behind the aircraft. We got that uh, pool here. And we go into the Citizen Soldier, which is for the Hoover Pitch. The Hoover Pitch. This maneuver. The Hoover Pitch works out real nice on this exchange. Um, nothing really of note. Just a nice, uh, you know, show to the crowd of, of showing them the top of the jet. Uh, I pause it there a little bit. I kick in a little bit of top rudder just to, uh, or top pedal to go ahead and yaw the nose up to just hold it up there for a couple extra potatoes. Afterburners are lit, and as soon as I see that, and I'm hitting show center, I'll tuck it under and then pitch. Uh, like is um, uh, with this is that that pitch is now going to have to occur so that the burner cans are pointed a little bit at show left and show center doesn't really get to see the burner cans um, but it uh, uh, and I do that a little bit intentionally because I want at least half the crowd to get kind of that camera shot view of the top uh, part of the aircraft uh, before I tuck it under on them and, and pitch over here. Uh, if I tucked earlier and tried to square the jet up right on show center, then nobody down here would really get to see anything. Uh, so that's kind of not fair to the people at show left. So I'll hold this thing usually a little bit long and then pitch intentionally a little bit show left, tuck it under again and pitch again. 
Uh, we'll do that exchange and I'll come back in for another tack pitch here in a sec. Citizen Soldier song, we let play after till attack pitch after attack pitch. As soon as these pull again on the second part of the attack pitch, we go into the, the outro song, which we are, we're using uh, what I've done, Lincoln Park this year. Uh, so over there at show left, I just carved back in uh, right on the 500 foot line at 300 feet, which is our, our kind of min parameters, hit it right at about 300 knots and then just set the lift vector at about, uh, about 60 degrees of bank and just square up the burner cans on the crowd. No battlefield, no battlefield, simply will not dominate. essentially a hard stop pull. I'm, I'm not pulling high alpha at all. Uh, I'm just pulling it uh, essentially till I get pointed 90 degrees away from the crowd and let the uh, aftermer shake the crowd just a little bit, tuck under and then pitch again. Last two maneuvers. Uh, I just set up, we got a little extra gas, so since that uh, that power loop was the first one, since it went into it, as it and as it came over there, the nose uh, waffled a little bit to the right and then kind of back to the left, that little bit of yawing on the back side of the power loop. Uh, I wanted to just go through and, and, and test the jet out and just go make sure it wasn't anything I was doing or the jet was doing. Uh, the jet's gonna be a little bit lighter fuel weight now, so um, it shouldn't have any kind of imbalance problems or anything. jet's going to pitch at the exact same, it's going to pitch over it at the exact same rate. Uh, what the jet's not going to need is it's not going to need as much control surface deflection to do it uh, because it's at a lighter fuel weight. The response from the jet, and that's one, another thing that's really unique about the Raptor is uh, kind of regardless of the configuration and, all the, and what we're carrying, the jet is going to respond to my inputs the exact same way every time. It's always going to give me that, that same standard response. Now as the jet gets a little bit lighter fuel weight though, uh, to generate that response, it doesn't have to move the control surfaces as much. Again, that's very, very different than a classic flying airplane where if you're not getting the response, the pilot manually puts in more controls to get the response that he's looking for. I simply put in the, 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 the control movement that I want, which in this case for the power loop is just a straight pull back um, and hold it there, and then the jet will decide to move how, the stabs however much it needs to. And if it isn't getting the response it wants, it will move them more, so it's not me you know, moving it and then moving it more. It's me just asking for it and the jet deciding how much it needs to do. Set up for one more uh, dedication pass. Uh, this one being from the opposite direction. The reason I did that um, wasn't just so we could set off every car alarm on base as I, as I come cruising over the gym. Uh, it, was, it was because when we go fly those, these low shows, if we take off in the opposite direction, we end up flying the first half of the demo in reverse order, uh, basically right to left or left to right. So. Uh, it's something just to practice to kind of keep in the habit pattern because even though you know left turn right turn doesn't matter a whole lot if you never you know if, if you only turn left every single time uh, you start to kind of you know get your skills start to get a little bit rusty so I just want to do one more uh, uh, dedication pass from left to right uh, just to make sure that uh, that everything was looking good that hey yep the, the left hand turn is going to work out exactly the same as the right hand turn uh, just get my cues for what it's going to center up on on the airfield make sure that I'm hitting the corners uh, markers that I'm going for correctly uh, and that that everything's uh, looking good with a, a left to right dedication again the cool thing with today is having good atmospherics for good vapor um, we get uh, good vapor on the jet on this one as well thing on this pass was I actually had to come out after murder um, right as I got to the to the show right corner uh, a little bit earlier than before um, because this one again now that I'm at a lighter fuel weight uh, I'm hitting uh, a little more G 
than before. Like I mentioned on the on the previous dedication pass, the one up front when it was uh, a little bit heavier weight, I was between eight and a half and nine Gs as I was going through there. Now that I'm a little bit lighter weight, the jet's accelerating much, much more. Uh, it's getting into that G a little bit faster. Uh, and here at the corner, it went right to, to 9.5. And after that, we set up for one last little tack pitch. And that was just, again, another good chance to square up the, uh, the burner cans on the crowd uh, in this direction. I don't do any kind of a, a tuck under roll on this one. I just uh, let it uh, let the burn cans shake the crowd and then just pitch again uh, and set up for landing. As soon as I'm out of that, the, the neat thing is uh, I set the lift vector. What I tried to do is set the lift vector so that as soon as I pitched, I could just hold it there uh, and with kind of minimal input, just pitch again and be right at my uh, pattern altitude. So now all I have to do is drop the gear and just start a turn back down to, uh, to land. So I um, was able to do that, hit those parameters right there. So as soon as I roll out, uh, the gear come down. As it pops up to uh, the pattern altitude and automatically the deer, you know, automatically, you know, but boom, I go for the gear handle. The gear and the Raptor are not an automatic thing. Yeah, exactly. I do earn my pay at least a little bit with remembering to put the gear down. So, uh, yeah. Hey, if they could, if they could put a button in there that said aircraft land, I'd be all for it. You know. It was good practice. Uh, we got everything in that we needed to today. It was it was nice that the weather cooperated for us eventually, uh, and we were able to get uh, a good solid high show practice in there. Uh, the music and narration looked good. Uh, the camera work was was very very good, uh, and I liked the, what you guys were doing with the launch and everything. So great job rolling with the weather and the flexing to a later time, moving from base ops over to the 27th lines. All that stuff worked out really really well. Uh, so that's all I've got. Good work today. What questions we got around the room? All right. Good work, gentlemen. Now that the practice demonstration is complete, most of the team members return to their squadrons. At air shows, the crew chiefs and the pilot join the rest of the team members at the tent. Each air show provides the opportunity to meet new fans, recruit for the future, and create special moments for the team. Most rewarding part when I do, I have a picture I have two things. I have two stories. Uh, one of the things is uh, I got some people that, that tend to take uh, what they call hero shots of me, and uh, I, you know, and I think there's something wrong in the world when there's more pictures of me than there is of Major Skalitsky or the jet, uh, actually. But uh, my wife and my daughter make fun of me constantly about, you know, oh, you knew that camera was there, you knew that camera was there. And I tell them, look, I, there's cameras all around me. I cannot pay attention to everything. Um, I'm watching what I'm doing, I'm watching the performance and stuff, and there's a picture out on the net that I found, and it was actually of uh, opening of the Sioux, uh, Sioux Falls Air Show last year. And I'm standing right in front of the aircraft, and my wife is standing beside me, and my daughter's standing beside me. And I'm in uniform, so I'm saluting, and they got their hand over the hearts, and it was taken you know, quite a ways away. And that's like my, one of my favorite pictures. And it was so rewarding for me, in my personal life, to pull that picture and go, hey, Look at that. Did you see that? And they were like, oh, no, 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 I didn't see that, didn't see that. Enjoyment. One of there's another picture that, uh, that I think speaks a lot about what this job represents and what uh, this job is about. There's a picture that was taken of uh, me. I didn't know they took it. Kids sent it to me. It was, uh, I was walking the crowd and I bent over and this little girl, about, I don't know, five or six years old, kind of came up and talked. She knew a lot about planes, a lot about the Raptor. And I was very impressed with how much this little kid knew about you know the jet and what we had done. Um, and literally, I sat and talked to her for a good 15 minutes. And I didn't realize it was 15 minutes till I actually looked down at my watch and I was late for a briefing. Uh, but that moment in time, it will stick with me for the rest of my life. And hopefully, it would stick with that person and you know the interaction. Now, if I had to just walk the crowd line and be, in, yeah, 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 hey, how you doing? Take my picture, yeah, yeah, yeah. And not stopped and actually took a knee or looked down. That's one of the biggest things we tell the guys when you're on this team is look down. You know, it, it's easy to see the, the crowd when they're at your eye level, but they're already almost where you are. You need to inspire the next generation. You need to, you know, inspiration and comes in so many forms. And uh, if you don't look down, if you don't sit, kneel down and talk to that little kid, there's 
what are you doing? You need to get the next generation in there to replace. And that moment in time meant a, meant a lot to me. And hopefully, you know, 20 years from now, she decides, you know what, Air Force is for me because of this one moment in time. It's uh, people at the shows, people at the schools, uh, going to the children's hospitals. I mean, this, the show itself is neat, and it's very, wow, and it's, uh, you know, it goes by so fast. I can't believe it's almost two years has gone. But the aspects that I'll be sitting at home watching TV or mowing the grass or, or doing something, once I'm done, once I take the flight suit and stuff off, it's not going to be really the shows and watching the demo and stuff. It'll be going to the children's hospital in uh, Milwaukee, going to the VA hospital in Sioux Falls, um, just letting, you know, the World War I veterans, World War II veterans tell their story. That's all they want to do is talk, talk their story. And some of these, some of these individuals have an amazing story. Uh, the heritage flight, our first heritage flight with the gentleman, we, uh, this guy was at the show every day before we were there. Uh, very dirty outfit, very dirty clothes. He had a rope for a belt. Uh, gray beard, very long gray beard, very stained from smoking. He was there before we got there, and he was there after we left. We were there 12, 13 hours. About the third day, I kind of stopped, and I talked to him, and I was like, you know, well, you're dedicated. You're out here more than we are. Come to find out, he was a test pilot for the SR-71 program. You would have never have known. You would have walked by this man and never known. For the next three days, the team, we got done with work, and we literally stopped by the bleachers, and he had brought his clippings, and he brought all this stuff out to the show to show us and showed us all this stuff from But Again, just wanted to tell his history. Just wanted to, and he just li relived the, the warbirds, uh, being out there amongst the noise and stuff like that. You could tell this gentleman had had a hard life since, but we gave him our heritage, our heritage patch and our, our team coin, and, you know, I know he had a big monster beard, but you could see that his, his grin touching his ears. But, I mean, you never have known this if you don't talk to somebody. You know, you would have walked by this gentleman and never gave him another look. But if you just top and let somebody tell their story, you know, you end up with an amazing story like that. I've been on the team for a couple of years now, and that really has been a life-changing experience. And, and I, I mean that sincerely, uh, because being on an Air Force base, you see a certain aspect of the military. But when you have a chance to kind of go out and see other, how other folks do business and see how other, say, militaries in the world operate, it really changes your perspective on the world. And uh, it's given me a greater appreciation for the United States Air Force and how good we have it here and how professional our folks are. So I'm really proud of that fact. So that's kind of, it, it re you, if that term makes sense, it re you up about really wanting to be in the Air Force and kind of make a change for the better wherever you can, however small it may be. 10 to 12 hour days, more than a dozen air shows a year throughout the world. Despite the challenges and demands, being a member of the F-22 Raptor demonstration team is one of the most rewarding experiences in the United States Air Force. We hope you've enjoyed your day in the nest.